<laughs> exactly. I, lo I love Mexico. Yeah. If the Lord would have let me pick which uh, which country to go to, that would have been on my yeah. wish list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, but we do we do have a lot of missionaries over there. Amen. Yeah, we have, well, I think we have three three uh, missionaries over there. Uh -huh. And I mean, they, they come here once in a while and mm -hmm. they, they explain you know, what's going on. I know it's pretty bad out there, but yep. you know, I, it was bad everywhere. Yeah, yeah. But Mexico's <laughs> version of bad is, worse. <laughs> is another level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mexico is another level. Believe it or not. Uh, when, when the whole COVID thing started and they were shutting down the uh, all the borders, I was preaching a missions conference in Guanajuato, Mexico. But I was serving as a missionary in Paraguay at the time. Well, in the middle of the meeting is when they shut down everything. Wow. Well, so, of course, it was only going to be 15 days. Everyone yeah. said, right? So I'm like, I'm thinking, oh, great. So I guess I gotta, I'm stuck in Mexico for another 15 days, which turned into 47 days or something like that. Wow. And then, and then finally I had to fly my wife and kids out of the country okay. through the Peace Corps and the embassy. But anyways, um. Uh, when we uh, when when everyone was shutting down and then all the masks and all the things were happening, uh, I noticed Mexico were they were the last people really responding. They weren't really doing much. And I asked the Mexican pastor. I said, uh, the whole world is shutting down and, and everyone's wearing masks and, and there's all these protocols. But I noticed you guys are not doing anything. What? Why? Why is that so? And the Mexican pastor told me, he said, Brother Manny, we are dealing with. Uh, drug cartel people that are hanging people from bridges after chopping their heads off. He said, we got other things that we're more worried about other than getting sick. <laughs> so I said, well, yeah. That's another level. Yeah, another level. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty intense over there when you go over there. Yeah. It's, it's been a while for me to go where I haven't been over there, but, you yeah. know. I, yeah, I tell people, where, where I live, I pastor in Beaufort, South Carolina, and a very conservative area, so everyone and their grandmother owns guns and all this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I hear gunshots every day where I live, but I live 10 minutes from Paris Island where they train the Marines. Mm -hmm. So you don't think anything of it. Yeah. So where I live, you you hear gunshots, you feel safer. But if you live in Southside Chicago, that's the, <laughs> it's the opposite. Yeah. So when I go to Mexico and I hear gunshots, yeah, yeah. I don't feel the way I do. No, when exactly. I'm <laughs> Yes, that's just the way it is. Oh. I guess it's time, is it? Let's go ahead and, uh, Hashmi, why don't you do me a favor and pass this out, please? I've got a little uh, handout here, and uh, it's a lot of information. I don't know if we'll be able to cover it all. We'll see. We'll, we'll cover as much as we can, and anything we don't cover, you'll have the notes. You can go over it in your own time if, if you want to. But, um... So I know uh, our dear brother down here in the end is going to Africa, praise the Lord, and then we have a brother here preparing to go to Chile, all right, and are, are, are you, oh, okay, you two at the end, okay, praise the Lord, amen. Uh, anyone else going, you said that you're, you're praying about things, and, uh, how about you guys? For me and my wife are getting ready to go to Ethnos 360 Bible Institute. Oh, okay. Amen. Um, our sister, or our, her sister, it just went through an MTC, because um, they're getting ready to pick where they're going for the mission field. Nice. Um, so we don't know if that's why I'm here to kind of learn a little more about sure. missions, just to see. Sure. So, but we're getting ready. We <clears throat> enroll in our, our first semester is August up in Waukesha. So. Amen. Amen. So we're and, and you, sir? I volunteer at a number of different missions. Okay. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, <clears throat> if any of you are praying about where to go. You know, everyone has a different uh, scenario, different situation. You'll run into a lot of folks that they'll say, I know, I feel, I really believe the Lord is directing me to go to the mission field. Some will even be convinced that they're called to the mission field, but we don't know exactly where to go. If any of you are in such a situation, come see me, and I would love to introduce you to a potential, uh, a p potential opportunity to serve on a mission field that I know about where uh, uh, there's some things that would be already prepared 
uh, for you to jump right in, okay? And of course, we would help you out in all this. But uh, if you're praying about a mission field and you're looking for an opportunity, I know of one. Or if you know someone that's in such a situation, I would love for you to uh, let them know uh, about, uh, about myself and, and what I'm offering. Um, so just something to consider. Let's go ahead and start. We'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into it, all right? Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, Lord, for the privilege to be here in this Grace Conference, Lord, and it's been a blessing to myself, and I know it has been to everyone else. It's an honor and a privilege to be here, and uh, Lord, I pray that uh, just as all the sessions have been so edifying, I pray that this session as well will be just as edifying, Lord, and perhaps some things uh, will be said, Lord, that will... Uh, give these dear folks, Lord, some things that they can consider as they're making preparations for whatever it is, Lord, that you have them doing in your service, Father. I pray for you to have your will and way in all of our lives, and I pray that you would guide in this session. I pray that you would speak to our hearts, and uh, Lord, that you would just give us some wisdom uh, that we may go about things in a manner that will be pleasing in your sight and bear much fruit for your honor and for your glory. And we'll thank you for what you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, let me start out by saying this. I do not consider myself an expert in missions or in anything, for that matter. If, if I was to be an expert in anything, uh, I'm pretty good at getting, getting in trouble. And uh, if you need any advice on, on that, I can help you with that. <laughs> but I don't consider myself to be an expert. Uh, but then again, who is? You know? And uh, I could, But I will say this, I could probably give th these notes to other dear men of God, some, of, some who are here at this conference. I wish Brother Ziner didn't have to leave today. But uh, Brother Ziner, a good dear friend of mine, served as a missionary in Mexico for 27 years. Uh, was the director of a large printing, Bible printing press, now is helping missionaries around the world to translate the Word of God. Come on in. Glad to have you guys. And so you get some missionaries like that uh, that really know what they're talking about. Uh, I'm sure I can give these notes to these guys, and they would do a much better job. But I did serve on the mission field. Uh, my wife is here. There's my wife, Maria, and my oldest daughter, Jasmine. And uh, we served on the mission field. We, ser we started out uh, for, we did a couple of terms in the island of Puerto Rico. Uh, I am half Puerto Rican and half Filipino. Uh, my wife is uh, Mexican by blood, but she was born and raised in Texas. She makes sure that I always get that correct. She wants everyone to know she's an American from Texas. So, and so, uh, but uh, I, we started out in Puerto Rico. We established a church, by the grace of God, up in the mountains of Hialeah, Puerto Rico. And uh, then the Lord sent us down to Paraguay, South America. And in Paraguay, South America, we worked with uh, one, two, three, five different churches, two of which were already uh, started, uh, but uh, one, was, one was barely hanging on, was a newer work, and had, still had much work left to do. The other one was a, a pretty well-established work, had been around for about 10 years by the time we got there. Unfortunately, the missionary that established that work and who was still uh, working with that church fell into, into some gross sin, and was ha he, 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 his pastor had to pull him off the field. And so, uh, as you can only imagine, uh, the people, morale was very, very low. And so we stepped in there and did what we could to get the ball rolling again. Uh, and so we worked with those two churches. We started a Bible Institute. And uh, I, in that Bible Institute, we had, we had as many as over 50 students, uh, 50 uh, male students and uh, uh, several women in the Bible Institute. And um, out of that Bible Institute, we were able to plant uh, three churches uh, from scratch. Uh, and uh, all three of those churches, uh, we give all the glory to the Lord, but... Uh, all of the churches that we work with have a national uh, that is that that was trained by us and is uh, leading those works, winning souls for Christ, doing a great job, doing a great job. And so, uh, with the little bit of experience that we have on the mission field, uh, when when the the good brethren here at Quinn Road asked me to uh, do a session, 
I was honored, and uh, and I started praying about what you know what what could we give uh, that would be a help and, and a blessing. And having served on the mission field, I, I'm no longer well. I'm still on the mission field, but I now serve as a pastor here in the United States. I'm pastoring the church that I got saved out of. I got saved back in 1988 in Beaufort, South Carolina, uh, Calvary Baptist Church, and I'm now the pastor of that church. Uh, my the former pastor of that church he was the pastor of that church for 45 years he retired and then the church called me asked me if I would candidate and the both times they asked me the candidate I said no I'm going to die on the mission field and uh, I had no intentions I had no desire to leave the mission field I loved what we did Tr there there are trials and tribulations like anywhere else like anything else but overall, we loved what we did. Uh, I was content to live the rest of my life on the mission field, had that been the Lord's will. Well, long story short, uh, through a series of events, the Lord uh, showed me that He wanted us back this way. And I'll share with you this much. One of the things that uh, had bearing upon our decision, manifesting or of what we believe uh, the Lord trying to show us that it was His will to come back, our church, the church that I pastor, is a church that has produced many pastors, many missionaries uh, serving all over the world, and me being one of them. And uh, we have several missionaries out of our church currently, uh, some in Papua New Guinea, uh, some down in South America, uh, Bulgaria and Eastern Europe and other places. And... Uh, they, when they heard that I was being asked to take the church, I had no interest in taking it, only because I wanted to stay on the mission field. I believed at the time that's where the Lord was going to keep me. But then these missionaries, they began to reach out to me, good, all friends of mine, some, some of which, some of whom I grew up with, and they said, you know, Brother Manny, we don't know what God's will is for your life. We know that you'll pray and figure that out, but our desire is that the Lord would allow you to become the pastor and the, the reason why is because have, having the experience that you have, having been a missionary, uh, no other pastor is going to understand the things that we're doing and that we're going through more than one that has done what we're doing. And uh, that made sense. And that was just one of many things that had a bearing upon uh, uh, on our decision to uh, move back to the States and, and pastor the church that we're pastoring. And in some ways, even though I'm not on the foreign field anymore, uh, we're more involved in missions than ever before. But now worldwide. And uh, I'm the director of uh, the Reina Valera Gomez Bible Society. And through that ministry, I'm connected to missionaries all over Latin America. We are right now in the middle of projects of trying to ship containers uh, filled with Bibles and gospel tracts and gospel literature to missionaries in Chile, uh, uh, missionaries in Colombia, missionary uh, one in Guatemala, uh, one in Costa Rica. Uh, we have a missionary brother in Peru who is getting the word of God into all uh, nine of the Spanish-speaking countries in South America, and we're involved with a whole bunch of different projects. We have a brother uh, in Mexico that's getting... Uh, uh, the Bible out, large container loads all over Mexico. We're, we're connected with that. Uh, we're praying about maybe starting a, a large distribution center on our church property. We own a, a several acres, acres of land, much of which we're not doing anything with. And so we're praying about possibly uh, starting a ministry by which we could provide material and resources. Uh, these are little details that a lot of people don't realize. Uh, and, and, but we, we understand them because we've been involved with it. And so uh, the Lord has opened many doors. And what I want to do in this little session here is just, just share with you uh, some of the things that we have been through and some of the things that we have learned. And perhaps it can give you some things to think about. You have a lot to think about, especially those of you that the Lord has already revealed, that He wants you on the mission field. You know where you're going. Others are praying about the Lord's will down the road. I just hope that perhaps we could say something to add to the things that you are taking into consideration and, and praying about. So that's my background in, in missions in a nutshell. Why this lesson? Well, the Bible says, and you know these verses, in Proverbs 11, verse 14, where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, 
there is safety. Proverbs 15, 22, without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Proverbs 27, 9, ointment and perfume rejoice the heart, so doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. And so that's all I want to do is just uh, give some advice, give, or give some, uh, tell some stories, and uh, uh, give you some things to think about. Uh, one of the things that, that I, I did, uh, and still do to this day, but what, one of the things that I did in preparation for the mission field, and even when I was on the mission field, was I listened to what other missionaries had to say. And I would seek them out. I would ask questions. And uh, I would observe the way that they do things. That's why I love coming to meetings like this Grace Conference, because... You know, every ministry is different. Every ministry and every man of God and every child of God is unique in their own way. So not everything is going to work for everybody. But I love coming to something like this because you'll see how others are doing things and how the Lord is working in their lives and, and getting things accomplished. And you may not be able to apply everything, but if you'll pay close enough attention, you'll get something that will help you in what the Lord is doing in your ministry. So uh, some things to consider as you're making preparations before you get to the field. And listen, at, at some point, I definitely want to have some interaction. And, and if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to ask. Uh, we'll definitely try to finish up this session with a time for questions and answers, okay? But if there's something along the way if you, th that you'd like to ask, feel free to ask, and we'll do the best we can. But uh, point number three, preparations before you get to the field, okay? First of all, you need to be sure of your calling. This might be the most important thing that I say in this whole, this whole session. You need to make sure of your calling. And there's a couple of verses there. Acts chapter 13 is when God called Paul and Barnabas, the first missionary sent out of the church of Antioch, uh, and separated them unto the gospel of God, just like Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, I believe in a calling. I know some that do not believe in a calling. Uh, but I don't know how you can read the New Testament every time Paul says, Paul called to be an apostle, and, and I don't know how many times you can read that over and over again and not see that there is a such thing called a calling. I believe that, uh, that you uh, should be called to whatever it is the Lord is, is uh, going to direct you to do. Uh, I, it's a divine calling. You, why do you need to be 100% sure of that? Because, let me tell you something, when you get to the field, you, everything that you, you believe, everything that you know is going to be challenged. You're going to be forced to think outside of the box, whether you want to or not, okay? Uh, not only that, you are going to, like anything else in a Christian life, wherever you go, whether you're the mission field or not, you're going to go through trials and tribulations. The world, the flesh, and the devil is going to give you a hundred reasons every day why you should quit, why you should be doing something else, why you should leave, okay? Uh, leave prematurely, uh, I might add. Uh, and so the, you're going to go through moments in your ministry where when the only thing that is going to keep you faithful, keep you going forward, is the fact that I know God called me to do this. I know this is where God wants me. Now, that can change tomorrow, but as of this moment... Until the Lord shows me otherwise, this is where God has me. And so I'm not going to go anywhere or do anything until we finish whatever it is God has called us to do for this moment. Uh, I think about my first duty station, if you will, up in the mountains of Hiuya, Puerto Rico. And uh, I remember going through a dry season. This, our first church, when we got there, there were nine people. Okay, there was a, it was a church that was already started by another missionary. I didn't, I didn't even want to go there to begin with. I, my heart was really in church planning. I wanted to go to another section of the island along the coast, uh, a section where I knew that there were no Baptist churches, and I wanted to go there and church, uh, start churches from scratch. But then the Lord made it very abundantly clear that He wanted us to go up into the mountains. I had never even thought about the mountains. My whole time on deputation before we got to the field. It wasn't until I got to the field that I even began to consider the mountains. But the Lord showed us that's where He wanted us. So we learned about a church up there that was started many years ago by some good men, good missionaries. 
But for whatever reason, every time they tried to hand it over to a national, the church went downhill. Closed down a couple times. When we got there, there were only nine people there. Okay? All very discouraged. Morale is down. Just doing whatever they could just to keep the doors open. So we had our work cut out for us. And then when we got there, of the nine people that we had, uh, five of them, for different reasons, left. And then it was down to just four plus my family. So even though we didn't start this work from scratch, but it was pretty close to starting from zero. Because there were many times that it was just... Even with the four people, you know how it is, if, if you've ever done a ministry, you'll find out everyone doesn't always show up at the same time. And so there were many times in the church auditorium, it was just me preaching to my family and one other person. You can only imagine how awkward those altar calls were, okay? And, uh, and you're going to go through some things like that on the mission field. It is going to challenge everything that you thought is going to challenge, am I doing the right thing? Why am I going so long and we're not seeing hardly any fruit, if any at all? You're going to go through some seasons like that. Uh, you're going to fight discouragement on the field, 100% guarantee. Okay? Of course, a lot of, almost everything that we're going to say concerning the mission field, you can say about the service of the Lord in general. You're going to fight discouragement. Okay? But in those moments of discouragement, the way you're going to overcome those trials, those uh, doubts, all of that second guessing that you will do, the way you'll overcome it is by coming to this conclusion. Look, I don't have all the answers to all the questions. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why things are not working the way I would like for them to work. All I know is this, God called me here. It was God who brought me up to these God-forsaken mountains. And so I, as long as I know that God called me here, then obviously there's something God wants me to do up here. So we're just going to keep doing it until somebody gets saved or until God works. And you know what? People eventually got saved. But it was a whole lot of work. We knocked on every door in, in, in that mountain. Now before you let that impress you, there weren't a lot of doors to knock. <laughs> okay? <laughs> you go to one community... And this community may have 30 houses, that one may have 50, this one might have 100. You can knock all of those in one day. Okay? Uh, and there were only maybe a dozen, maybe a little more than a dozen or so communities to go door knocking. When you're up in a big old mountain that's 4,400, was it 4,400 4, feet uh, above uh, sea level or whatever, uh, you got houses scattered all over the place. So I remember... It, five hours, uh, here's door-to-door -door visitation in the mountains, five hours to knock on two doors. Because this guy's way over here on this side of the mountain, and this guy's way over there on that side of the mountain, and you're driving, and the road is so narrow, you don't even know how your vehicle uh, is fitting there. And then you look down the side, and it's the drop, it's the bottomless pit. And it's scary. And so uh, you're going to go through some times. And you're gonna you'll, you'll travel around the mountain. You'll go you'll go through all the things you're gonna go through to reach people. You may tra you may drive a whole hour to go try to visit someone, and they're not even there. So now I got to drive a whole hour back. All that wasted gas for nothing. And you'll go through these things, and you're going to fight discouragement. Well, that's discouraging. I just put in two hours of driving for to visit nobody. And so in those moments, that's when you, you're calling. Is what's going to keep you faithful. And like I said, uh, long story short, we eventually saw soul saved. I'll tell you more about it maybe going forward. And there's a that church in the mountains of, of Puerto Rico is, is established. It's not a mega church uh, or anything like that, but it's got a good, strong core of people. And there's a, 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 a an excellent national pastor uh, uh, that is saved and loves the Lord and doing a great job. And God did all that. Okay? But had we given up the thousands of times that I considered it, we would have never seen the fruit that we saw. So, you're calling. You need to be sure of your calling. You need to learn to be a self-motivator. You need to learn to be a self-motivator. A lot of these points are going to seem increasingly obvious, but, uh, but I've seen so many missionaries that did not make it. They say that... Uh, 
60% of most missionaries that do deputation, according to a study done by a ministry called Regions Beyond Ministry, 60% of most missionaries that start deputation never finish. Of the 40% that make it to the mission field, 75% of them will not even make it past their second or third year. So think about the ones that make it as far as they do. Okay, uh, many people quit, many people give up due to discouragement. Some for legitimate reasons, such as health and, and things of that nature, or God just changing your calling. In our case, God took us from one field to the next. And uh, at, once we got our work done in this work, in this area, then he took us to another area. And so there's legitimate reasons as well. But you must learn to be a self-motivator. Uh, I put down the verse, 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, about when David was greatly distressed. A time when everyone was against him so bad that they were talking about stoning him. And uh, the, because the soul of the people were grieved, was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. Uh, but David encouraged himself. Notice, David encouraged himself. Brethren, if you're going to serve on the mission field, or if you're going to serve the Lord anywhere in general, you're going to have to learn to become your number one best encourager outside of the Lord himself. Okay, And what I mean by that is just through your relationship with the Lord. If you don't, if you don't have a strong prayer life, you need to get one as, as fast as possible. Okay, Because again, you're going to go through situations on the mission field. The only thing that's going to keep you there, number one, will be your calling. Number two, will be a, a strong prayer life. Okay, uh, I, I remember, I'm thinking off the top of my head about the time, the many times there was uh, up in the mountains, we had a little pathway that would lead me to a little brook. And many times I'd walk that pathway uh, with a Bible in one hand and a machete in the other to clear the path and get to the little brook. And there by that brook, there was this large rock that I would sit there, I'd read my Bible and I could pray, talk to God out loud. And, and uh, I, would, I would experience the peace of God there. And so many times I would go there with a broken heart or with a heavy burden. And, uh, but there on that rock by the brook, uh, the Lord would calm me down and, and wrap his arms around me and let me know, look, don't worry, I've got this. I've got you. Everything's going to be all right. Uh, you're going to, you need to establish a consistent and fervent prayer life, okay? Something else you need to know in preparation for the mission field. Know that there will be opposition. You're not going to do anything for the Lord without the devil attacking it. I've been preaching in my church through the book of Nehemiah, and it's just amazing. Uh, Nehemiah, you know, I'm sure you know the story about Nehemiah. The Lord put upon his heart. He had a great burden to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And before he even got started, you don't even get out of chapter 2, right after getting permission from the Persian king, uh, automatically, uh, here comes Sanballat and the enemies of Israel ridiculing Nehemiah and already slandering and making lies. Brethren, I don't, my desire in this session is I want to try to help you to get a, a, a little bit, I don't want to scare you for the mission field, and I don't think, I'm not going to be able to do that if you know that you're called anyways. But I do want to try to help you to have a, a, a realistic view rather than, other than what some of us refer to as a romantic view of the mission field. A lot of people have this view of, I'm going to go to the mission field and everyone's going to like what I have to say. They're going to all get saved and in a couple of years we're going to build a great big work and it's going to thrive and, and all the, we're going to have all the funds that we need to build everything that we want to build. And I'm just here to tell you there's a great chance that that's not the way it's going to work. All right? Um, there's going to be opposition. And uh, you're going to receive opposition from uh, the people that you help the most are many times going to be the ones that are going to hurt you the most. The people that you do the most for are going to stab you in the back. They're going to betray you. Remember the story of Jesus. You want to be like Jesus? Well, then you're going to have to have your Judas Iscariots as well. You're going to have the folks that are going to want to crucify you as well. Uh, some of the people that will be close to you one day. Uh, I have literally, we literally know people that cheered for us with applause and shouting when we arrived to the mission field. And today they hate our guts. <laughs> uh, there are people that we have helped and 
sacrifice so much, uh, setting ourselves back to help them, and today don't want to have anything to do with us. And here's the thing, this is the reality of mission, mission work and the ministry in general. And I could go on and on. I could tell you stories of the disappointments, the betrayals, the setbacks, lies. I've had national pastors who I trained, did so much for to help them, who have lied about us from the pulpit. And I've had to call them out and say, you know that you're lying. You know that that's not right. And things of this nature. So, but I don't want to discourage you. Because here's the thing. You'll go through all of that. But on the other hand, you'll also have people that will get saved. And you'll have people that they'll get saved and they will love you to death. Sometimes it'll be people that you aren't even really thinking a whole bunch of. And they'll surprise you. It may be the people that you expected the least from. And so you, you have to soldier through all the negative stuff if you want to enjoy the good fruit. Okay? And so just be aware. There's going to be opposition. When I was in Puerto Rico, there were a team of pastors, national pastors, that formed what they called the committee. This became a joke among some of us uh, missionaries. Better watch out, the committee's going to get you. And uh, they, they were determined because of some doctrinal issues that they disagreed with us on. Uh, they were determined that we were a bunch of heretics, me and two other missionary friends of mine. And they were determined to form this committee and to go to each of our churches to convince the people to vote us out. And they will do what they could to help us out. When they first, when I was first warned about this, I was warned about this from my good friend, Brother Charles Meek. He was a, uh, the oldest missionary on the island. He's with the Lord now. And when he called me to warn me that this was happening, I laughed it off. I said, oh, come on, Brother Meek. You know how people talk and they say things and then nothing happens? But then it happened. Not in my church. The next Sunday, this committee shows up at the church with other pastors, okay, uh, they have their own churches, but they show up on a Sunday night at my friend's church with 20 or a mob of 20 or 30 disgruntled uh, former church members that haven't been to that church in like 10 years, okay? But as soon as they heard that there was an opportunity to get rid of the missionary, for some reason, they had an interest to come back to church after so many years. And they formed this group of people and caused so much trouble that multiple police cars had to show up to the church to escort the people out of the building in an orderly and peaceful fashion because of how violent, how, how, how ugly things were getting. Well, when that happened, the missionary called me and said, this is what happened. So, the next Sunday, I, uh, I spoke, I preached a message, Matthew 16, about how when Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I told the people, I said, listen, I hear that there is a group of people. I know that they're already communicating with you. As a matter of fact, the secretary of my church would show me, share me the text messages from one of those pastors saying, here's what they're saying about you, pastor, and they're, they're, they're planning on, on getting rid of you too. And so I, I had a meeting. With my, I preached my message, and then I had a meeting. I said, listen, uh, if you guys don't want me here, okay, as much as that will break my heart, but uh, my, my heart, I'll make it real easy uh, for you. If you guys tell me you don't want me here, I'll leave. I'll shed a bunch of tears along the way, but I'll pack my bags and I'll go on down the road. Fortunately, you guys don't pay me a salary anyways. <laughs> so I live off the support of churches in the States. So it's not going to hurt me financially, but it will definitely hurt me uh, you know, spiritually, emotionally, but we'll move on. I don't want to pastor a church that doesn't want me here. <clears throat> That's not going to be good for anybody. And uh, I said, but now, if you do want me here to work with you, if you do want to go forward, let's win souls and all of this. Let's, let's stay focused on, on the gospel and what, what the Lord would have us to do. But I tell you what we're not going to do. We're not going to have a bunch of people that aren't even members of this church come in here and not tell us how to run our business. I said, if, you, if we have a problem, we'll handle this as a church. This is between us. It's none of their business. They have their own churches. Go deal with your own problems and leave us alone. I have enough. I do a good enough job getting myself in trouble. I don't need you to help me with that. And so, one by one, people in the church stood up and said, No, we're with you. We want you. And, as a matter of fact, they were so offended because before I showed up, they went years.
years without a missionary, without a pastor. So they were so offended. They said, Brother Manny, we went several years. We begged the churches. We begged the two Bible colleges on this island to please send us someone to help us. We're struggling just to keep the doors open. And no one would send us anyone. And then the Lord sent you to us. We finally have someone. Now souls are getting saved, baptized. The church is starting to grow. And now they finally get together to help us get rid of the, the, uh, the, the preacher that we finally got. While things are going good in the church. And so I'm just, I'm sharing with you stories like this so that you can understand. You're going to go through stuff like this. Unfortunately, it's going to happen. Read the book of Acts. Anybody that's going into missions, you need to become an expert in every verse of scripture in the book of Acts. And you'll, when you read the book of Acts, you're reading about the first missionaries of all time in the history of the church. Look at all of the things they went through, all of the opposition. Guess what? If you're called of the Lord, it's not going to be any different for you. You need to know this. All right, we need to go on. Anyone that, before we go any further, any questions, comments, or anything? All right? We'll go on. Uh, except that part of your job is to be a fundraiser. I'll try to rush through some of this. And there's verses of Scripture to demonstrate all these points. You can read that in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. When you read the ministry of the Apostle Paul, you find that he was, if you'll remember, he was raising money to help the poor saints, the poor persecuted saints in, in Jerusalem. Uh, this is the part of missions that is not so fun because there's nothing more awkward than asking a bunch of Americans for money. But you have to get over that because at the end of the day, I know we're not in it for the money. We're not. I'll preach for free. I'll preach for free plenty of times. I'll preach on the streets. done it plenty of times. But at the end of the day, if you want a building, it costs money. If you want light, it costs money. If you want to get Bibles, it costs money. Nothing was more of a rude awakening to me than when I went down to Paraguay, South America, and in one of the churches, there were people that had gotten saved there even before we came and had been saved for months, some even more than a year, and yet they never had, they didn't have a Bible. I would see folks coming to church with no Bible, and I'm thinking to myself, that's strange. You gotta have, if you're going to come to church, you've got to have a Bible. We don't have any. Well, that's a problem. In certain, I don't know where the Lord may send you. That may be an issue where you go to. It's, it's so odd to us as in the United States of America because I go down to the Dollar Tree or the Dollar General and buy a King James Bible for 99 cents. But how many of us have Bibles sitting in our coffee tables and, and you know bookshelves that we're not even using anymore? They're just collecting dust. These are things that... Uh, you need to be aware of, okay? You may want to have hymn books. Or if you don't want to have hymn books, if you want to have a screen or, or whatever to put the music, however you want to go. If you want to just hand the music out on sheets of paper, whatever way you go on that matter is going to cost money, okay? And so you have to accept the fact, if you're going to be a missionary, you are a glorified fundraiser for the rest of your life. And it's going to be so awkward in the beginning, but you have to do it. Especially if you're in a field where you cannot work. Okay, when I went down to South America, it was illegal, okay, for me to work. I couldn't do that. So I was going to have to raise the money through the churches. And it's awkward, but it's something you have to, you have to accept and get over, okay. Uh, you have to learn to be diplomatic without having to compromise your convictions. So you have to accept the fact, especially if you're going to do deputation, and I know not every missionary does deputation, but most do. And when you go on deputation, you're going to find out there are no two churches on the planet that sees everything eye to eye, that are in agreement on everything. If we were to go down this one by one in this room, I guarantee you it wouldn't be very long for us to find something we don't see eye to eye on. But at the end of the day, if the only people I can fellowship or have anything to do with are people that agree with me on everything, then I can't even be married. Because... You know, spoiler alert, if you're not married yet, you're going to find out you're going to have disagreements. Well, what is it that helps you to get through those times of disagreement if you're married? Well, I love my wife. And so, uh, you know, I'm not going to go to the divorce court just because we don't see eye to eye on something. No, I'm going to consider things, okay, we don't see eye to eye on this, but at the end of the day, I love this woman and I need her in my life and she loves me. So love teaches you to forgive some things. And it's the same principle when it comes to the churches you're going to work with. 
we had churches that fell in love with us, with my family, and our ministry, even though there were some things that were a little bit different in the way that they taught things and the way they did things. But they were such a blessing. They became, uh, not they didn't just support us with their money, but they became emotionally invested in our ministry. And that's going to become so vital. You're going to, you know, so you have to learn to forgive some things. And, and this just called being diplomatic. Okay? Uh, I put down a point on point number F here. Preach. Preaching is more powerful than folks realize. If you're going to major on anything, there's so many different a uh, aspects of mission work. But if you're going to major on anything, may I encourage you, major on the preaching part. You want to know what, I've, what I'm seeing more and more? What people want more than anything else, they want preaching. That there is nothing, and I'm look. I, I'm a, I consider myself pretty open-minded. I'm not against programs and activities. Look, anything so long as it doesn't violate the instructions of the Word of God, I'm for it. I'm a I'm an out of the box thinker. But there is nothing in the world that can replace good old fashioned Bible preaching. The Bible says. The Bible even said, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it, the preaching of the cross, it is the power of God. Amen. Let me explain something to you. When you get to the mission field, you're going to try all kinds of things, and you ought to. Try all of it. Do everything that you can to try to get things done. But it's going to ultimately be through the preaching where you see the power of God working in people's lives. And you're going to have to learn to understand that preaching is so powerful, you have to have the faith and confidence in knowing that there are things going on in the background that you're probably not even seeing with the physical eye. Just trust that the preaching is getting the job done. That the seed of the Word of God is accomplished. Because, I'm, listen, I'm telling you, you're going to go through dry seasons. And they are not fun. We want to see results. We want to see things happen. We want to see fruit. Why shouldn't we? Right? That's what we went there to do. But you're going to go through seasons where you're not going to see the fruit as soon as you would like to. You're going to have to just trust that the preaching of the Word of God is accomplishing what it was set out to do, whether you see it or not. Eventually, you will see it. It may be a long time before it happens, but if you'll stick with it, you will see it. Okay? But preaching. Okay? Okay? Uh, I can't emphasize the preaching of the Word of God. Develop all the boldness that you can. What's going to happen is you're going to go to the field and you're going to experience culture shock. Things that we do without even thinking about it here in the United States of America because this is our comfort zone. We're Americans. We grew up here, right? Uh, you, I, go, I can go to the bank here. I can go to Walmart. I can go to the gas pump. All these different things. It's second nature, Right? When you go to the mission field, all of those things become stressful situations. Just going to the bank is a stressful situation. Uh, you're going to be thinking, okay, I'm going to enter into the bank, and the bank teller is going to be over there. I might have to greet this person. What am I going to say? You don't think about that here in America. You just go in there, do, do your business. On the mission field, all these tiny little details we take for granted is all heightened. Ten times or more. Okay? Why? Because you're not in your comfort zone anymore. You're in a different culture. These things, I've known missionaries that never got over that hump of, of the culture, and the, the culture shock. And you know what? Uh, uh, some of them, uh, they would stay in the house. I remember uh, one missionary couple, uh, or one, one young couple, they came up to the mountains. They were, they really believed God was calling them to come work with us. Well, they came up to the mountains, and when they saw how life was up in the mountains, now they were city folk, but when they saw how life was up in the mountains, they were so shell-shocked that the wife stayed in her bedroom the whole time. The whole time. Finally, the last day of their missions trip, I took her down to the city just to calm her down, took her out for pizza, tried to give her a little bit... When you get down the mountain uh, in the city of Ponce, they have American restaurants and things like that. So I took her to some American restaurants so she could, you know, uh, feel a little bit better in all this. And some people don't just don't get over it. But you have to determine in your heart to soldier through that stuff if you want to become more effective on your mission field. You have to accept this is home. 
You have to have the grit and determination. I am going to conquer this. It may take a while, but little by little, I'm going to do the best I can to become more accustomed, okay, to these things. Just be aware that you're going to go through this type of stress, okay? Here's another point. Talk to older missionaries when you need advice on spiritual matters. I encourage that. Talk to younger missionaries when you need advice on stuff that has to do with money. <laughs> okay, let me explain to you why. Because when I first went to Puerto Rico, my best friend on the field was Brother Charles Meek. One of the godliest, humblest, sweetest uh, men that I've ever known, okay? Uh, he's with the Lord now. So much wisdom. He had so much counsel, to, And I listened to anything he had to say. The only exception is I should have never talked to him with <coughs> money advice. Because uh, I was leaning upon him for uh, and his wisdom so much. So when I asked him uh, economical things, he would give me advice with the best of intentions, but what wasn't jiving with me was he was giving me advice based on how Puerto Rico was 30 years ago. And the economy today is not what it was 30 years ago, okay, anywhere in the world. And so what I found out is this is where the younger missionaries, they may not, they may not have the wisdom that the older brethren had, but they're a lot more keen as to the material needs that we were also going to have. And so uh, I always told missionaries, look, Talk to the older missionaries when it comes to, you know, winning souls and dealing with the culture and spiritual advice and all of this. But find you some veteran missionaries still, but that are a little bit younger that can relate to what your financial and material needs are going to be when you arrive to the field. So just a little tidbit of uh, advice there. Trust that the Lord is going to take care of your financial needs, your material needs. We, uh, when we did deputation... Do you guys remember that recession that hit back in, what was it, 2008? 2007. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. They said that was the worst recession since the Great Depression of the mm -hmm. 1930s. Remember how all the houses were going into foreclosure? Everyone was losing jobs? Well, guess what? That's when we started deputation. Mm -hmm. The worst time to raise money. Uh, but God provided. Amen. Every church we called, it was the same story. We can't have missionaries in anymore because folks are... Losing jobs left and right, and we can barely even handle the missionaries that we that we have now. Uh, I would still beg them. Well, listen, I, I understand you can't support us. Can we at least just come in? We at least need meetings. And guess what? They would give many of them would give us meetings, and we would go, and the Lord would do something, and they'll say we can't afford it, but we're going to take you on for support anyways. So be persistent, okay? But these were the times that we were living in. And at the same time, I was trying to sell my house. We had a house and two acres of land, uh, three, three be uh, bedroom, two bath house. We were trying to sell it. We put our house on the market just as that recession hit. You talk about bad timing. Mm -hmm. We went two years and the house just wouldn't sell. Finally, uh, we got to a point, I'd never been in this situation in all of my life because my father taught me growing up, you're the man in the house you take care of the financial needs of your home. You don't depend on the government. You don't depend on no one else. You be the man that you're supposed to be in, in, in all this. And he taught me to work. I grew up working on construction sites and all of this. And uh, money was never a problem. I was never rich. But, you know, we provided for our needs. Uh, but then this recession hit. And then we're traveling all over the U.S. trying to raise support to go to the mission field. And our house is just not selling. And it's getting to the point where I can't even handle the little bit of bills and the mortgage that I had. So then they started threatening the foreclosure of our house. And I just told my wife, Marie, I said, listen, uh, I'm not going to go to the mission field with a whole bunch of debt. I don't believe in that. I don't think that's right to put that kind of burden on, on everyone else, on the churches. So if the Lord, if a miracle doesn't happen, um, we're going to probably have to stop this deputation and maybe revisit the mission field idea some other time. Talk about depressing. And I'll never forget, it was, we was up in Connecticut. And that night, I had, we had reached a breaking point. And I said, you know what, we're just not making it financially. We, we, can't, we can't keep doing it like this. And uh, the house was not, is not selling. And uh, if the, you know what, I think, I think we're done. I think we've gone as far as we can go. 
This will be our last meeting tonight. We'll drive from Connecticut all the way to Beaufort, South Carolina. And when we get home, I'll start sending letters out and announce that we're not going to be able to finish deputation. So, we go to our meeting in Connecticut, in this church. Depressed. I had the fakest, most hypocritical smile on my face when I presented the work. And then the pastor, he says, I, I want you to present your work. I want your family to sing. And I want you to preach. The whole nine yards, okay? Usually that would excite me, but I'm so depressed because I know that this is it. I'm done after this. So I go up there. We do everything the pastor tells us to do. I preach, but I'm just trying to get the message over with so I can go home and sulk and cry and, and, and then begin our journey back home and all this. Well, I get to preaching. The people get to liking it. People are shouting amen. Usually to a preacher, that's exciting. The only problem is, I'm in my mind, I'm thinking, don't amen this. This is not good. I'm done tonight. Well, so I get done with my message, right? Depressed. Discouraged. The preacher gets up, he says, I thought that was, that's one of the best messages I ever heard a missionary preach. I, and I'm thinking, really? Were you listening to this? And uh, he said, you know what? I feel like the Lord would have us give an invitation. The altar's flooded. A couple came forward, got saved. This is the worst preaching that I think I've ever done, I'm thinking to myself. And then the pastor says this, after, after all of that, he says, you know what, usually when a missionary comes, we wait to our next business meeting to consider taking them on for support. But the Lord did something so special tonight that I feel like we ought to just vote tonight to take this missionary on for support. In my mind, I'm thinking, no. Don't do that. This is going to be another church I'm going to have to disappoint when I announce we're not going to the field. So they voted. They took us on. First time that church ever took a missionary on in the same night. Right there. So that night we go to our hotel room. And it was, at that time I only had my two oldest daughters, Hasmin and Clarissa. And I told my wife, I said, listen, let's do this. Let's ask God one more time, just one last time, to do a miracle for us. So, let's kneel around this bed here in the hotel room. And I'll kneel on this side, Maria, you on that side, and let's get our two girls. Now, they were only like four or five or six years old at the time. They are still in car seats. I said, but I want them praying too, just in case my prayers don't go through. I know theirs will. <laughs> One of us is going to get through here. So, we're praying, and then, so we pray. We go to sleep. Next day, we're driving down the road. I get a phone call. It's our realtor. She's crying. You know things are bad when the real estate agent is crying. She cries and she said, Mr. Rodriguez, I just want you to know we finally found you a, a, a buyer for your home. As soon as you get back to Buford, get here as soon as you can so we can sign a paper. And she's crying. <laughs> I don't know if she was saved or not, but she knew what we was going through. And so, not, not only that, then I got a call on that same trip, same day, heading back to the house. Now, not only was the, our home a problem at that time, but we were broke. And we were building debt and all of this. And uh, that's why I, I was going to quit because I'm thinking to myself, I need to pay all this debt off if I'm ever going to go to Mission Field. So then I get a phone call from another good friend of mine, Brother Danny Kessler. He now serves as a missionary in Bulgaria. But at the time, he was praying about going to the mission field. And he said, you know what? I don't know why, Brother Manny, but last night, he didn't know that that was the same time we were praying. Last night I was praying, and the Lord put it on my heart to give you a love offering. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, wonderful. And I can tell by the way he's talking, he's probably going to give us like a, a big love offering, like maybe 500 bucks thousand bucks and and I told brother Dan I said Danny I know you you're one of my best friends do me a favor before you make a de final decision to give me this love offering pray about it again and make sure that this is what God wants you to do and that you're not just doing this out of friendship because once you give me that money I'm not giving it back <laughs> I want to spend it. so he calls me back on that same trip he said look my man I prayed about it again I'm not praying about it anymore I already know what God wants me to do I want to give you a love offering. Give me your bank account information. And you deposit it in our bank account, $17,000. Wow. To help with our debts. 
So I'm just, what's the point? The point is, listen, you're going to go through some tough times, but God, in His perfect timing, He's going to take care of everything. He's going to take care of everything. Listen, we only have six minutes left. There's no way in the world I'm going to get through all this stuff on the back. Uh, but they're there for your consideration. Uh, let's take the last few minutes. Any questions, just shoot away. Make something up. Let's have a, a little bit of discussion here, and, and we'll wrap it up here in just a minute. Anything uh, Anything you have, you've been wondering about, any doubts, questions, anything? How old was your... Did you guys have kids when you first went to the mission field? We had our three daughters, and my son was born on the field in, in Puerto Rico. Yeah. How many uh, How many churches did you guys start up? We started three from scratch when we got to Paraguay. And uh, and we worked with three others. Uh, the one church that we established in Puerto Rico, reestablished. And then the two churches we worked with that were already started in Paraguay, they merged. And they're they're doing great. They're doing very well. Yeah. Did you guys train nationals to take over the church? Every church that we work with has a national that we train that's over the work. Yeah. I had a missionary call me uh, about a month ago. He met one of the nationals we trained in Puerto Rico, and uh, he was so impressed with him, and he said, Brother Manny. He said, I've been here in Puerto Rico for uh, 11 years now, and I don't have any potential, anyone with potential to take the church. Uh, and then I saw the guy that the Lord provided you and that you trained and all this, and he's such a good preacher. I was so impressed with him. What did you do? And I said, well, first of all, you have to understand the story with this guy. Uh, I can't take the credit. He got saved in prison reading a Bible. That's how he got saved. Wow. This guy was a cocaine crack addict. He was born with one leg bitter with life because of his situation of one leg and uh, was a heroin crack addict uh, four times in prison. His fourth time in prison uh, the prison doctor told him you are going to die in this prison. You've got some type of sickness we can't cure it. You're going to die. Well that scared him so bad that Brother Quito Pablo, that's his name uh, he started praying. He's not safe and he begs God if you'll let me live I promise to give you the rest of my life. So after that prayer, he starts reading the Bible, finds out everything the Roman Catholic Church told him was wrong, and that salvation is only by grace through faith in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ. He gets saved. After that, the prison doctor that told him, you're going to die, well, he died. And another doctor took his place, did another checkup of Quito Padua, and he said, you know what? I think there is something we can do. To help you. So they did some type of operation. He lived. He survived. He got cured uh, cured up. So then he gets out of prison. He starts hopping around different churches in the mountains. And then finally he landed in our church. And I'll never forget the day he called me. He said, can you come to my house? I, need, I have something I need to share with you. Which was the story that I'm telling you now. I'm sitting in his living room. Tears coming down his face. He said, I made a commitment to God. To give him the rest of my life. And I need to keep that commitment because God kept his end. Will you teach me how to serve the Lord? So I start crying. I said, man, I've been looking for you. Where have you been all these years? <laughs> and so he, we started a little Bible institute. He started coming. And then outside of the Bible institute, he would come to my house so many times. We'd sit out on the back porch. With, uh, my wife would make us a big old pot of coffee. And he would have a notebook. And uh, I just would teach him everything. I, was, I think I was even making some stuff up just to give him anything I could. And uh, wonderful brother. But when I told that missionary, he said, what did you do with this guy? I said, really, I didn't do anything. The Lord brought him to me. So all the credit goes to God. But one thing I can tell you is this. I started praying for the Lord to send me national men to train for the ministry from day one. Amen. From day one. And so I would encourage you to do the same. Pray for men to train, leaders in the church. I got time for one more question. One, one or two more questions real quick, and we'll, we'll close this up. All right. Well, if you think of anything, I'll be around for the rest of the day, and uh, I'd, I'd love to chat with you. I hope that that was informative. There was so much more I would have loved to have said, but uh, time, time has run out. But you guys have been a great audience. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, I just pray that the Lord will bless whatever it is that he has.
for you in the future. Right? All right? Let's have a word of prayer, and then you'll be dismissed. Our dear Heavenly Father, once again, Lord, we want to thank you, Father, for your goodness in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the honor and the privilege to serve you. I pray for these men, Lord, that are preparing for the mission field. Lord, these men and women, that you would bless them and strengthen them in a mighty way. Give them all the wisdom and all the tools and resources they're going to need, Lord, to just do a wonderful work for your honor and for your glory. And for these that are still praying about what you would have for them in the future, we know, Lord, that your timing is always perfect. And so we just pray for your continued guidance. And I pray, Lord, that the things that were said today are some things that they could take into consideration as they're uh, still formulating, Lord, uh, what it is that they need to do in preparations for whatever your whatever uh, way that you would have them to serve you. Lord. I pray that, that you would bless the, the remaining activities throughout the day, and uh, we'll just give you all the praise for all of your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Excuse me. There's one thing I just thought of it while you started praying, uh, but for the couples, when you guys get married or whatever, make sure when you're out working your mission field, you include your family, your wives and your children. We have seen several families already wind up off the field of divorce because the husband went off and he was with his men. He was working and everything, but his family was left behind. And his children grew up rebellious, bitter with God, bitter with the church, because their dad was never around. He was always with his men. So, just that. I wish I would have had the time. That was actually one of the points that I wasn't able to get to. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Someone said, a wise man said one time, if you can conquer your home, you can conquer anything. Amen. That's true. God bless you guys.